There have only been three consensus protocol families. So let me maybe walk you through uh, these three families and how they work. So we have classical. And this is the work that started in the 70s. And my colleagues with two of them, uh, Leslie Lamport and Barbara Liska, both of whom have Turing Awards, the highest uh, award in computer science. They developed this field. There may be hundreds, uh, perhaps thousands of papers in this area, permissioned uh, blockchains all use classical protocols and new efforts like Ethereum 2.0, um, you know, EOS, etc. They or Tendermint. These are all efforts to resurrect um, classical protocols. Now, the nice thing about classical protocols is they can agree uh, very fast, but they don't admit large numbers of nodes, and everyone has to agree on who those nodes are, who the committee is that's making decisions. So you can only have small committees. That's why EOS has a committee of 21. Um, that's why you know, Ethereum 2.0 is, is considering 64. They would love to go to hundreds, but they can't. These protocols don't admit that. So um, Satoshi knew about these protocols. When he came on, on the scene, this area was incredibly well established. He looked at the whole lot and he said, you know, these things are very fragile. Everybody has to know at all times who's in the room. It's like, imagine if you have a Senate making decisions, and uh, as long as you and I agree on who's in the Senate, then we'll be fine. But in a computer system, it's very hard to, to get that level of what we call synchrony, that level of, of having adjusted our worldviews. So imagine you have a UK Senate, and they're, they're making decisions like, are we in the EU, are we not in the EU? And, and the set of people that you think are in the Senate are not exactly the same as the set of people I think are in the Senate. And that leads to an enormous problem. Now, now nobody knows if we're in the EU or not, right? And uh, so, so that's a problem with classical. And that's why Satoshi looked at this and said, look, I can't use this. These are not robust protocols. And by the way, if you talk to the architects of these systems, like the people behind Ethereum 2.0, they will tell you that they expect failures of their consensus protocol because it is fragile. The foundation is fragile. Now you have Satoshi Nakamoto's protocol, which is super robust, right? We have this mining thing going. I mine, I tell everybody what the decisions were. That's really good and everybody builds on my blocks and we all agree and everything is great, except I'm burning energy like there is no tomorrow. There is a lot of energy being sucked out of the, the network. The store of value is a terrible store of value because you're constantly paying the power company. So, okay, so where are we then? So we have these two protocols. One of them is kind of efficient, but is very small. The other one is very and fragile. And the other one is very robust, but it's slow. Right? Decisions take 10 minutes. Uh, it's limited in throughput, you know, at three transactions per second per Bitcoin. And it's wasting energy like there is no tomorrow. Last year, a year ago, there was a paper dropped uh, by an anonymous group calling themselves Team Rocket. Team Rocket, as you'll recall in, from Pokemon, uh, they are Satoshi's greatest enemy. So in comes the Team Rocket paper, and it describes a totally different way of doing consensus. And it has the best of both. It's fast like classical, so decisions are within a second. It's high, high throughput. It's, uh, in the lab, we've gotten 19,000 transactions per second. Wow. Uh, Visa is something in the rear view mirror. People thought, oh, we'll never reach Visa level with Bitcoin. We have to go to layer two, blah, blah, blah. No, you can reach these levels. And you can reach these levels without making a decentralization trade-off, with you, without going to just a couple of nodes. So we can have thousands, if not millions of first-hand participants. There is no mining, you and I or anybody else could come in and they could become the Jihan Wu of, of this new system that we're building. This is fascinating. This means that we have this giant, giant thing and it, it operates in a super robust way. You and I don't have to agree on who's in the system. You know, of course we have to agree to, to some level, but we don't have to precisely agree. And uh, it's so robust that even if uh, there are more attackers than, we, than the, the system designers planned for, it still doesn't entirely collapse and, and just keel over like all these other protocols do. In fact, it can withstand 51% attacks. So it can withstand attacks even higher than 51% without liveness, but it, it won't lead to safety failures at that level. So it's got these incredible properties 
uh, by combining some features of both into a completely different mode of operation. And it sidesteps everything that people have been taught about how other protocols work. You know, you can't make Bitcoin scale. The core guys are right. The Bitcoin devs are right. You can't just amp up the size of a block and, you know, start building gigabyte blocks. It's just not going to happen. And whatever, you know, BSV guys are telling people, it's just, it's just ho hokey stuff. It's, it's wrong. They're misleading you. So instead, um, it has a different mode of operation. It admits greater decentralization than any other coin. We plan to go live with hundreds of participants. And Bitcoin is only 19 mining pools. It's not that many participants. And so all these when other- you put it like that, I mean, we talk about the infinite number of, of Bitcoin miners out there and how oh, anyone can enter the network, but really there are very few mining pools. There are very few mining pools. So uh, people will tell you that there's invisible decentralization that you know, behind a single mining pool, there are uh, tens of miners. You know, that's correct. There are probably tens of miners, you know, maybe hundreds for some of them. That's fine. Um, but they've all come together for a common enterprise. Those guys are working together. And I assure you, not one of them is checking the work of the mining pool operator. Mining pool operators could be, could be censoring transactions. We'd never know. Um, you know, people were part of the nice hash mining pool and their machinery was used to attack Bitcoin gold. And they had no idea. So, uh, you know, all of those things that people say about invisible this and that, it's like the emperor's invisible clothes. It's just, it's just BS. It doesn't actually exist. <laughs> At the end of the day, there are really 19 pools. And, you know, it does it matter that they are not a corporation, but a pool? Not at all. They got together to do a common enterprise and they're part of the same thing. There it is. And, and then you can count them and it's 19. I counted them. Ethereum is even worse. It's 11 um, at the moment. If, if they go to Ethereum 2.0, it's going to go up to 64. And that's much nicer. It's better than EOS. Everyone makes fun of EOS, but it's 21. It's better than the other guys. So it's really funny, the whole thing, like this, this decentralization thing, there's a lot of theater out there. And at the end of the day, the numbers are tiny. And Avalanche promises to completely change this. Walk me through actually how Avalanche works, because all of this sounds too good to be true. You're talking about something that's faster and it's cheaper. It doesn't use as much electricity and it's more decentralized. So like, how, how is this enabled? Okay, so the way it works is different than others. It provides a probabilistic guarantee like a Nakamoto consensus. And uh, it works as follows. Uh, it's e really easy to understand compared to most other protocols. Imagine that you, I, and our uh, 99,000 best friends are in a giant stadium and we want to make a decision. We want to pick, let's just say we want to pick between two colors, red versus blue. And uh, let's imagine this is a very big stadium and you don't know everybody in it. I don't know everybody in it, but I know some people and you know some people and we want, we want to make a coordinated decision. If we were using classical, everybody would try to talk to everybody else. It would be n squared messages. So 100,000 squared is a very large number, 10, 10 billion, I think. So that's 10 billion messages would be on the internet. It, it's just not gonna work. Uh, we could do Satoshi Nakamoto style mining. Somebody gets, you know, gets selected by the kiss cam and then they say, oh, hey, you know, it's red, I picked it. And then everybody builds on it, we go on to the next thing. That's okay too. But here is how Avalanche works, and it's very simple. So it's going to work in rounds, and every participant at every time step does the following simple thing, which is pick randomly five people in the crowd. Just look around, you know, those five. And you ask them what color they prefer. And they'll tell you something. They'll be like red, red, blue, red, blue. And then upon hearing this, every node updates its own preference to try to align it with what it heard predominantly inside the network. So after I asked these guys, I got back predominantly red answers. So I flip my preference and I say, okay, I'll go with red. It looks like the network based on my latest sample is going towards red. You do the same thing and you might get blue and other people might do, you know, you know they get red or blue, but depending on how they pull. Now the cool thing is we repeat this and we will end up repeating this a tiny number of times because the following weird process is going to happen. This is a process we call a metastable because in physics, there's a very well-defined counterpart for systems like this. These are systems that tend not to like being in the middle. They, there's the metastable systems. They love making a decision and getting stuck 
in that decision state, right? So they, like the a solid will, will crystallize into one form or another, and then it will remain in that crystal form on, until you heat it up again. So in this network, we have this, this uh, initial starting point, and the very worst thing I could imagine, or anyone can imagine, is a split network. Half the people like red, half the people like blue. Now, if I do this protocol for one round, you can easily see that it's incredibly unlikely that we will stay stuck in that midpoint. We will oversample because of just random, random asks, the way random asks work. And, you know, maybe we, let's say we oversample red. And after one round of everybody sampling, and mostly just by chance, it could be blue as well, but just by chance, they will get more red answers than blue or vice versa. And if that happens, you are no longer at the midpoint. You have, let's say, slightly more reds, 51% more red than uh, compared to 49% blue. And now you can see what happens at the next round. I am slightly more likely to go red because there were more reds in the last round. And so that makes me 51% more likely to go red, which means that at the end of the second round, there will be around 53% reds. And I repeat this once again, and there will be 56% reds, and on and on and on. And you can see that this is kind of like going down a cliff. The more reds there are, the more likely everybody else is to pull red and to turn red. And once this starts happening, you quickly start going down a cliff, at the end of which, everybody has chosen the same color. And the math shows that for even a very large network of hundreds of thousands of nodes, about uh, 17 rounds or 20 rounds or so are sufficient to reach consensus. So instead of sending you know, 100,000 people talking to 100,000 people for 10 billion messages, I, a participant, ended up asking five people 17 times. It's like 85 messages. That's almost nothing. So that's why it's so efficient. And it's, it's kind of magical. And then the, the magic comes in the proof that this actually works. That if you were to do this dinky process, it's so simple. It's just put your weight behind what you think is the predominant thing. And yet it's so powerful. It, it aligns everybody and uh, it forces all the honest um, nodes towards the same outcome. And once they've reached that outcome, they're immovable. If we are a network of reds and you want to double spend, now you want to say, hey, you know, I was, Naomi paid Alice, but you know, wants to take it back and pay Bob. Well, how are you going to do that? The network has already made a decision. They pull each other. They're like, yeah, we picked, we picked the first, uh, first transaction we saw, right? And then they say yes. So, um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, the way it works is different. This is totally unlike everybody else. There is no mining. It's very efficient. And um, as I said, uh, it's completely green. When there is nothing to do, the network wastes no energy. And the amount of energy used is tiny.